From the family grocery hauler to fire-breathing racing engines, the one name you need to know is USA Motor & Machine, located at 51 Cleveland Avenue in Nashville, Tennessee. Give them a call at 615-726-3725 or at usamotorandmachine.com. If you're looking to learn guitar, check out Dave Isaac's Guitar Studio on Music Row. Whether you are a beginner or hobbyist, to professional songwriter or artist, Dave offers a unique and powerful method of instruction that teaches not just the instrument, but the whole musician. Find out more at NashvilleGuitarGuru.com. Well, Merry Christmas, everybody. Hope yours was as good as Larry Woody's and better than mine, because his sure was. Welcome into this edition of Christmas Pit Pass. I'm Joe Williams, and joining us, Yes, a special Yuletide gift for you. Nashville racing legend Gary Baker returns. We'll continue our conversation on all things Nashville and racing coming up next on Pit Pass. Jeff Meeks and Chris Austin invite you to watch your favorite sports event at the Batter's Box at 43 Hermitage Avenue in Nashville, Tennessee. The Batter's Box offers shuttle service to all Titans home games. It's a great place for friends to gather for the game and after the game. So check out the Batter's Box Bar and Grill and thanks again for sponsoring the show. Today's show is brought to you by locally owned and operated Highland Rem Speedway. Highland Rem Speedway is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year with great short track door-to-door -door stop car racing in a safe, family-friendly atmosphere. Visit their website at highlandrim.com. Welcome everybody to Pit Pass, the special Christmas edition. No, I did not join the British military. You look very Christmassy, Joe. Well, I shaved my beard. I got finished last <laughs> night, so... We, we were able to, you know, got almost everything taken care of. Give us a ho, ho, ho. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> Larry That's Woody. It. As long as he doesn't sing it. <laughs> exactly. Oh boy, you got that right. Gary Baker on the end. Gary, going to welcome you back. It, it's, you know, we have fun doing these, but what's been so much fun the last few weeks is it's not like work. Larry, we're just kind of sitting around talking to old friends. I can get to renew acquaintances with old friends over the 40 years like Gary and Hope Hines, some of the people I hadn't seen. Doesn't get any better than that. I, you and I are sitting here talking, has it been 40 years? Yeah. I don't know. That's in some ways it seems like it's been 80, but uh, you know. It, <laughs> Remember no, that kid I'm, reporter that showed up from the Tennessee in one day and said, Mr. Baker, which way do the cars run? That, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't recognize you. You but, were uh, 10 pounds less. And, but uh, I, we had some good times back there. Yeah. And uh, yeah, a time or two we squared off, but uh, it was always, it was always as two gentlemen and uh, you had to power the pen, and I understood that, so I knew not to argue with you too much. Uh, eventually, I had to power the pen, and you knew I was right anyway, so you gave in. <laughs> I gave in. There are times yeah, you gave in. We didn't have many squabbles. When we you had, were... a, had a dispute or two over, over issues at the fairgrounds, but overall, it was a pretty, I thought, a pretty good relationship. And, uh, and if you looked at it objectively, I think, Gary, both you and I wanted the, the same thing. We wanted best what was for the best for stock car racing at the fairgrounds and in Nashville. So we were Absolutely. on the, we're, we're, we're traveling the same path. Sometimes we might have veered a little, but we both wanted to go in the same direction. Well, there was one, I, I remember uh, one of those incidents that uh, seemingly at the time was pretty major. But uh, I will say, before I, before I get into that one, um, <laughs> People sometime in, in the city of Nashville did not understand. You take for granted what is so commonplace to you. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the time, of course, we had two automotive sports writers in the, uh, Larry Woody, of course, and Joe Caldwell at uh, what was then the Nashville Banner, the afternoon paper. But what people didn't realize, uh, they read them every day. Because stop and think again, you didn't have all the social media back then, nowhere near the proliferation of magazines, uh, of cable television and all that. Realistically, most of your um, automobile racing coverage, news, whatever, dissemination of, of current information came through Larry Woody or Joe Caldwell if you lived in Nashville. But the thing of it was, these weren't just um, uh, fact disseminators. These were real automotive writers, and I'm sort of patting you on the back now. And I really, if it wasn't Christmas, I probably wouldn't do this. <laughs> but um, the fact is, we had two of the best uh, in the country. Now there were there was one or two that were well known in Charlotte. Uh, I can say the same for one in Daytona, uh, and only one. Um, and there was a smattering Birmingham, Atlanta, and all that. But I know for a fact uh, every day. The, the, the powers that be in Daytona checked the Nashville papers. They wanted to see what Woody and Caldwell had to say. 
uh, true fact. Um, they wanted to know what these two riders had mm -hmm. to say. Uh, and that's a pretty strong pat on the back for our two sports riders. But there was one time there. I'll try to make this short. After patting me on the back. After patting me on the back. Here we go. Here it comes. There was one of those that, um, <clears throat> it was one, I, I don't remember the exact time frame, but we were trying to, to bring racing back to the pinnacle um, here in the city of Nashville. And it was at the startup of one of the three years of the, of the comeback, 85, 86, mm -hmm. or 87. And you know how it is. You've always got 98% that are super happy, and you've got 2% that want to find something to gripe about. And I'm talking about really here our drivers and our participants and all that. Um, somehow you and one of those two percenters hooked up. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember what the gripe was. It was something, it, I, as well as I remember, and Joe, maybe you could help me if you remembered it at all, but it was something, as well as I remember, about the purse or about, somehow it was finances. Um, and I, I had already dropped the, the back gate, if you remember, from $15 a head to $5 a head, really just saying, guys, I don't want a dollar out of y'all. You just pay your insurance and, and come through that back gate and all that. Fairboard didn't like that, but I was worried about taking care of our guys. I was not worried about taking care of the Fairboard. Um, well, whatever. The gripe came out in the paper one day, big and loud. Um, and I just remember calling a meeting of the drivers. Uh, and I said, I knew who it was, but one of you guys have <laughs> talked to Larry Woody. Uh, <clears throat> it was a guy who I'd helped get a sponsorship, pretty big, one of the best sponsorships on the track. Uh, so I was not really real happy at, at the time we had this meeting. And I explained to the guys that, uh, hey guys, I've got a lease. All I got to do is write a check for $12,000 and I never have to open the doors. I can padlock this place in a minute. But I said, guys, either we pull together uh, as a racing fraternity to put this sport back on top in Nashville like it can be, or forget it. We're not here to fight each other. We're here to race each other, doggone straight, but we're not here to fight each other. And we're going to pull together or we're, gonna, we're just going to padlock this place and forget it. The drivers right there on the spot voted to run the next week for zero purse. And I don't remember, we gave a bunch of it to charity or something, but they wanted to show their solidarity by running for zero purse. So Larry, you did me one of the best favors there was <laughs> when you put that article in I, there. I saved you a few bucks. You saved me a few dollars and all that stuff. But oh, uh, my, my philosophy, Gary, when I was covering like other sports, if there was a controversy, I tried to get both sides. And I, I think I remember the case you're talking about. One of the drivers was complaining about the, the high cost of a pit pass. He's having to buy a pit pass for himself and all his pit crew and everybody. He says, wait, we're coming in here and ra racing and helping Gary make money and we're having to pay him for the privilege of, of racing and if you remember now I, I, I would never write a story that's controversial until I got both sides so I, I did call you and I got you a bunch of whiners you know if, if it weren't for me they wouldn't have kind of the message you preached in pit road but I always tried to be fair in the same way it's kind of interesting with the fair board with some of the squabbles there I'd go out to the fair board and I'd get chewed out for taking the fairgrounds the, the, the racetrack side I'd go to your office and I'd get chewed out for taking the fairgrounds the, the uh, fair board side so I figured as long as I'm getting chewed out by both sides I'm doing my job. What was his job. middle name Joe Mr. Controversy <laughs> oh, yeah. at that time oh, yeah. something like that? It's old newspapers. <laughs> it's old newspapers. But no I, I thought overall you did a great job but not overall you did a great job running the track I'm not sure anybody else could have done it uh, not forget doing it any better I'm not sure anybody else could have done it and as we've seen Gary in hindsight I think history bears us out since the Gary Baker era it really hadn't you know Bob Harmon had some, <coughs> some fairly successful yeah. seasons but even it was obviously not not anything to compare to what Gary was able to do well, let me tell you let me tell you where you're at and it'll tell you exactly what happened see this is this is the great part about having been there and watching so you were in I was in, in it. yeah yeah June 1st, 1985, we had, uh, we, Gary, had, you got in the track back in March and gone through all the stuff and, and we were trying to put some things together. Uh, one of the very first, it was the very first night we'd done what, what became discount nights mm -hmm. in a uh, local radio station. Everybody got in for 95 cents. Mm -hmm. uh, the drivers had come to us, <clears throat> most of them had, and said, we'll run for free one time. And that's when you said, if you'll do that, then look, five bucks cover the insurance. I got, you know, legalistic thing or something. Uh, yeah, there were one in particular and maybe another one who didn't like that idea. Um, and Gary, you pretty well, uh, exactly what you said, as I recall, <clears throat> pretty well uh, nipped that in the bud. And, you know, I think the 10,000 people that went in there that, that night 
kind of quieted down that 2% because they started to see uh, what could be done when we work together uh, as, as a racing fraternity. I'm because tickled you to hear walk, those kinds of yeah. details. Isn't it good that we've got somebody around that <laughs> the has a memory that remembers all these well, details? You've got, you got to remember, though. I mean, if, if we're going to tell the war story, you've got to remember. Um, you, had, you had been kind enough to, to uh, bring me away from Siberia and down from the fair board that had been for six weeks after Warner went broke and uh, put me back to work at the racetrack. And uh, you probably don't remember, but I remember awfully well that Saturday evening standing in your office mm -hmm. and you going 95 cents. Y'all really mm -hmm. think this is going to go? Yeah. You know, there's not 4,000 people. You know, we're going, and I'm thinking, and I told you, I said, yeah, I know I got to clean my desk out. Mm -hmm. And, um, wasn't there a radio station 95 yeah. that was yeah, a was, sponsor yeah. and that was a 95 That's how it got deal. started. And, and Joe, you wouldn't believe how many times I've worn myself out horse telling other promoters, Gary Baker, when he was there, used to have these promotions and let people in for a buck. Well, and then sell them twenty dollars worth of concessions, hot dogs and cokes. Oh yeah. And, well, and <clears> other <throat> promoters could never grasp the concept. Oh, no. Still that don't. Gary grasped. It's better to have twenty thousand, uh, twelve thousand people in at a buck a head than three hundred people well, at full price. And that's what happened this night. We were having that conversation, yeah. and, and you know the crowds at Nashville are typically a little late. And uh, I'm getting a little nervous myself. And uh, Peggy Clark was working with us, and Peggy was in her office, and she was getting a little nervous. And uh, about that time. Uh, your dad, C.S., and your brother, Ronnie, were running concessions, and your dad came in and uh, just kind of showed you, uh, you know, said, and you looked, boy, that's not a bad night. He said, Gary, that's not a bad night. That's the first drop from the first concession stand. And I saw your eyes go, really? <clears throat> and from that point other, on, well, can't it other took off. Couldn't other promoters see what you were able to do with some of those discounts and stuff. Now, some of it was the fair board. I know the fair board got all bent out of shape because you're offering discount tickets. And they said, well, part of our payments tied into ticket sales. Gary is trying to, to uh, pull something fast, pull a fast one on us. And you tried to explain, would you rather have 10% of, of 12,000 or 50% of 1,000? And they never really grasped the, the math, did they? They didn't, uh, and, and of course part of it, we had three years left on that original lease, mm -hmm. so we knew the first year we were going to have to basically give the gate away. Uh, second year, sort of start turning the tide. The third year, okay, let them. The, the concept being, if there is a great show going on out there on the track, uh, and people just come and see it for once, if they did only pay 95 cents to get in to see it, uh, and they say, wow, Henrietta, this is pretty neat. We need to get on back over there. And obviously the concept worked why it was a good show on the track. Sure. But it also enabled you to bring corporate Nashville to the table. Uh, it would be the kind of deal where I remember a, a, a good example would be, uh, I believe it was uh, Ms. Winters that uh, we did that deal with where um, we were running a 200 lapper. And I said, okay, I'm... I'm perfectly happy with with a with a five dollar ticket. So what we did, we priced the tickets at ten dollars. Yep. But if you go buy Miss Winners uh, with any purchase, you get a coupon for five dollars. Well, all of a sudden, uh, wow! You're telling me I go buy a, a hamburger at Miss Winners for three dollars and fifty cents, and I get five dollars off at the gate. Uh, this is sort of a no brainer. So needless to say, uh, was Winners big time happy uh and i'm trying was joe was that winners or yeah miss winners we did one well yeah i think it was miss winners but if you'll recall they called us and said hey we've run out can we print some more because we had a number you know, you could print yeah, up too they had gone down they had gone through like yeah. twenty five thousand yeah. or something uh and they said it was just it was just mm -hmm. uh, they were gonna have to re-oil the hinges mm -hmm. on their doors because yeah. we were wearing wearing the front doors out with customers coming in so needless to say, corporate America starts adding up these dollar bills and they start saying, we need to do this some more. Uh, but it, it does mean that, yeah, Larry, exactly your concept. Sometimes you don't worry about trying to balance the books on the, the front gate. It's the net of all the, but uh, now the fair board did respond to that because in our lease, they had no piece of the concessions. Mm -hmm. And of course right. now they want a piece of everything, yeah. um, including corporate sponsorships, which we, that first year, yeah, we pretty well carried the, the, the track on the back of concessions and corporate sponsorship. 
But again, those are some of the things that would drive you nuts. And I can understand why you'd be a little, little testy with some reporter gadget at you when you're trying to keep this ship afloat. But, uh, but those are some of the things, you know, I'd, I'd go to those fair board meetings. I said, man, we got to watch out for this Gary Baker guy. We're, uh, some of our leases tied into to ticket sales and Gary's out there giving them away with a, a ticket with a bread wrapper or a piece of fried chicken or something. And they weren't smart enough to understand that, that a piece of, of 12,000 fans, part, part of 12,000, they were getting a portion of it. Yes. And, and <clears throat> that a little was better than nothing, which is what they'd have been getting basically if you weren't doing those, those uh, promotions. And they never quite, it's almost like Gary, like a matter of principle, that they'd, that they'd cut off their nose to spot their face. If we're not getting the whole thing, then let's just sink the ship. Right? Well, there was a lot of truth in that, but it, it was one of those kind of deals at the time you're thinking, what's good for the sport of automobile racing? What's good for these participants coming through the back gate, the spectators, the city of Nashville? What is good for the, for the corporate body of everybody that you're responsible for here? And frankly, when I start going down through my list of priorities, the fair board just didn't appear on the list. Yeah. So I was not worried about the fair board. I was worried about all of those yeah. well, two, priorities. Two questions we always tried to answer was what comes first? We, do, do we get, if we get more cars, do we get more people? If we get more people, do we get more cars? And we were all, it, it was always that which came first. And then what happened was it exploded. We had both. Real quickly, yes. Mm -hmm. But as we've indicated before, it was a different time, too, from the standpoint of getting cup drivers in here. I know one 200 lepper, I think we had seven cup yeah. drivers. Mm -hmm. uh, Tim Richmond was the eighth one, but he didn't drive. He, he stole the pace car that night and, and had a police mm -hmm. chase. But we had, we had fun. But back in that day, you could call up Dale Earnhardt and say, hey, Dale, could you, uh, you're not doing anything Saturday night. Uh, it's an off week. Could you come over here? Uh, yeah, okay. Now, days, of course, you've got to go through 10 layers of, of right. PR and all that kind of stuff. It, it's a different day-to-day -day from the standpoint of getting those kind of... But, but those are the kind of draws that would bring the people in to see it for the first time. Then when they saw it and they said, well, wait a minute, we can go... And the kids are always free. Mm -hmm. Kids yep. free. You always have kids free. Mm -hmm. Because when those kids are free and when you cater to them with the concessions, mm -hmm. Dad always made sure the kids' concessions were there. Uh, and then, okay, now it's Saturday morning and the family sitting around the breakfast table. What are we doing tonight? We're going to the movies? Well, the kids, eh, that's boring and that'll cost us. And, and, and mama is saying, well, yeah, but at $8 a head, yep. look what that's going to cost us versus going down here to the racetrack. Kids are free, all three of them. Um, and you and I get in for $4 a so it's eight dollars for for the whole family. Yeah. Uh, now, never mind the fact they're going to spend forty dollars on yeah. concessions. But, but you don't tell them that. Yeah, but well, seriously, Gary, it's great, great marketing because, and we see it at every shopping mall. You pass through food stores or confection areas where candy is, and you can ha you can take a sample. You can try a sample, and if you like it, go back and buy a bag full. And that's what Gary Baker is doing. He's giving them a little free sample. Hopefully, they, this, is, this isn't bad. Let's come back next week at, and buy a ticket and watch, watch this. If and, the, and it works. If the show is good on if, the track, yeah, it works. If they like And it, in they, our case, the show was good. Yeah, try it and see if guys, you like it. I hand that to the guys out there on yeah. the track. They were putting on a show. Yeah. In, in our case, I'm going to tell you the show was great. But that's I I, I got a little 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 personal there. Too. A, lot of, a lot of it's due to the announcing. Uh, no doubt. No, I, no, I wasn't announcing that. <laughs> Golden I throat. Smart enough to give that up. Uh, tell you what, we're going to talk more with Gary Baker when we come back. He mentioned uh, drivers being upset. Gary Baker may have been one of the first in the country to see an attempt to unionize his drivers. We'll talk about that and more when we come back on Pit Pass. Well, welcome back, everybody, to the special Christmas edition of Pit Pass. I'm Joe Williams, along with Larry Woody and our special guest, Gary Baker. When we're done here, you know, we... I kind of thought about going over the batter's box yesterday for Christmas dinner, but eh, hopefully they were off too. So, But you can go today down to the batter's box, Hermitage yeah. Avenue, and grab some lunch and have a big time. Uh, when we left, Gary, we were talking a little bit about a couple of times drivers kind of flared up. In 1979, you, uh, you and your partners took over 78 was, was when Bristol, you was, Mr. Bristol was 78, 78 Nashville, Nashville was 79. 79. When you bought Mr. Donahoe. Lanny Donato's. Hester was the okay. primary track manager at the time. Made the decision. Only time in, in the <clears> entire 50-plus <throat> years of the track that there was not a, a tr track champion. But you didn't, didn't run enough races, as I recall. Uh, you, there were six <clears> planned and five got rained out. It was <clears> one of those kind of deals for the weekly show. 
but uh, without running the normal 18 to 20 events, uh, there were actually a couple of drivers, uh, one in particular, who said, we're going to unionize and force them to run. You remember <laughs> that? Not much. Uh, <laughs> Aren't you glad Joe's bringing up all these pleasant memories? Some things, yeah, I just assumed. I, I think I remember it. Joe. It was Tony Formosa. It was, it was may have been. That, uh, yeah. Behind the, the, the how, do you, how do you unionize independent <clears throat> contract? Well, you know, could it be done? It, obviously, the, the same thing was attempted uh, with, with Big Bill France, uh, France Sr., with uh, the guys down at Talladega. Yeah. And then the, the aftermath of that. And uh, of course, that's the reason Curtis Turner, now we're really going back now, but that's the reason Curtis Turner was put on the sidelines, who at the time was, uh, you know, he was just one of the top three drivers in NASCAR, and all of a sudden France just said, Bound for life. You're, you're not allowed on track anymore. Banned for life from NASCAR. That for trying pretty, to. That pretty well ended that. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, nobody else wanted to bring up the topic anymore. No, and no, it was one of those kind of deals that, uh, you know, had there really been a, a union, a unionization of the drivers, there wouldn't have been a racetrack there for the duration of the lease because I, I did grow up. This was back before NLRB uh, days, but I remember uh, there was a company my dad had that uh, unions uh, were wanted to come in and they wanted to stage a vote. And my dad just called them, meeting the employees and said, fine, guys, vote it in. But if you do, don't waste gas tomorrow driving in uh, because there will be a padlock. Um, obviously, it was rough enough trying to run a racetrack with a fair board looking over your shoulder. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thought of a driver's union, mm -hmm. just like Bill Sr., he knew it wouldn't work. So that was – the idea is – get the doors open, uh, get the track running again on a weekly basis, and treat the drivers so well that, uh, as you would any one. employees, they don't want one, they wouldn't need one. They know that the door's wide open and they can talk with you anytime, day or night. Uh, if they've got a gripe, bring it to you, you'll address it. That balance, that balance between <clears throat> um, the promoter on one side of the fence and the driver and the team on the other side of the fence it's so critical uh, on a weekly basis because the promoter's got to worry not only about what's happening, what we call the front of the house and, 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 and make the show, putting the show on, but there's the other side where you've got to have good officials in place and, and, and you've got to have a good show without staging a show. This is not uh, WWE kind of stuff most of the time. It turns into it occasionally. Uh, but that balance on everybody working together is really critical. It is, and I was always cognizant of the fact and a strong believer in the fact that the guys out there are the ones putting on the show, and, and I appreciated that fact. Uh, frankly, it's one of those kind of things, if I have a gripe with NASCAR, did I say if I have a gripe with NASCAR? Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the gripes you have. One of the NASCAR. gripes I have with NASCAR, and I love some of those people to death. I mean, you know, I just, I'm crazy about a lot of those people in NASCAR, but as a, as a corporate culture, if there's one thing that, uh, that I would put high on the list, it would be this concept of um, the teams. They're just, uh, you know, you pay for the privilege of showing up at a NASCAR track, and you pay dearly. Mm -hmm. And even go back two years ago when um, there was sort of the double whammy coming as far as the, all the nationwide teams, um, purses were slashed pretty drastically. The same year purses are slashed, all of the fees that you paid for uh, to, to have the privilege of coming through the gate to, uh, to put on the show for them, all of those fees went up. And I'm sitting there saying, now, you know, is this right? I mean, do they charge the, uh, Eddie George when he's coming <laughs> through the gate? Do they charge Chris Johnson? Uh, um, I tell you what, Locker, Johnson, y'all pay us, and, but we're going to keep charging you, uh, increasing your charge for you to come in. And while you're at it, oh, wait a minute, you're going to drive a car down here, pay to park your car while you come in to put on the show for us and all that. And if you wreck your car, tough luck, it's yeah. up to you to haul it out and fix it. Yeah, because, uh, and you know, yeah, Chris Johnson, if you break your leg, it's your own, your own. Uh, hope, you, hope you can patch yeah. it up, but uh, don't look to us yeah. or the NFL. It, th there's a culture there that says, hey, man, whoa, that, that just, uh, we need oh. to, to favor these guys a little more and be a little more um, 
uh, empathetic with the fact that, especially on the nationwide teams, uh, some of these fees are just getting pretty exorbitant. Tell us about those fees. I mean, obviously, just off the top of my head, you've got to pay a fee, a fee to get a license. NASCAR to be, license. To, be, to be a member of NASCAR. Yeah. Well, yeah, the, the, the car license itself, but also each individual member of the team. So the car, the car also has to have a license. Yeah. Car has to have a license. Each individual member of the team has to have a license. You've got to pay to get into the pit area, which is either included in the license fee or you pay it each week. Um, you've got to pay for a spot to park your hauler. Uh, typically, no, you don't have to pay for that, but after uh, your allotted number of parking passes, yes, you have to pay. After your allotted number of, uh, you know, if, if Woodrow here is the chief of communications for my sponsor who's writing the checks to put the car on the right. track and he wants to bring eight people, I say, well, okay, bring fine. Do I turn around and say, oh, by the way, on the eighth one, you got to start <laughs> paying. Right. I can get seven in, but you're going to have to pay for the eighth one. Yeah, yeah. And, and all thereafter at the tune, I can't remember now, it was, it was, a, it was a horrible fee per person. It was like uh, 70 bucks or 80 bucks or something. It, it was bad. Um, and so obviously you can't do it. So then the team has to start eating that. It, and it just, every time you turn around, it was something else, but at the same time, the purses are going down while those fees keep going up. You got an entry fee, you got to pay an entry fee to enter the vehicle. Now, yes. if you've got two cars, do you have to pay two entry fees? If something, oh, so absolutely. If you're, you're going to take a backup, now you've got two entry fees. Plus, and I don't think, this is something I don't think a lot of folks understand, and it I didn't really think about it until a couple of years, there's an inspection fee. Oh yeah. For your car to go through NASCAR's tech line, and if you have a problem with your primary and pull out your secondary, you're paying another inspection fee. How much are those fees? What are those? What are those well, on an annual basis, uh, as well as I remember, our budgets used to run uh, a little over a hundred thousand. In inspection fees? No, or not just, just inspection. Oh. I'm talking about uh, all fees. of them. We our fees. Uh, <laughs> Normally, as well as I remember, they were somewhere in the hundred and twenty thousand range mm -hmm. that we would pay. Um, four to five grand, a, four to five grand a weekend. Yeah, and then when and you, that doesn't include travel. Oh no, no, travel, no, no, no. That's just lodging, uh, meals, everything. That's that's the fee we just would pay NASCAR for the privilege of putting on a show. <laughs> just for to get on the track. Hadn't uh, bought a tire yet. No, hadn't, hadn't bought, bought an a tire engine or, or a gallon of gas. Uh, no, the, not a dollar. And and it just mm -hmm. uh, it. I'll admit the nationwide financial business model, it's broken. It it just doesn't work. Well, what would it cost the former Baker Curb Racing Gary to go to an average nationwide race for a weekend when you pay all inspection fees, everything we're talking about here, plus the the food, lodging, travel <coughs> for for all the team members and hauling the car down and everything? One one race weekend would cost you what? Well, roughly? let me let me be all inclusive there um, because it too much detail to start trying to break it out. But you'd, but have when include, you start, you'd have to include the driver's salary, obviously, in that port. Per well, exactly. Race. Yeah. Uh, and you even include the, the, the cost of the transporter mm -hmm. amortized over whatever, sure. 40 races a year or whatever. Um, in, in the ballpark range, it cost us, and we weren't one of the highfalutin teams by any means. We weren't, um, we weren't a back marker. Uh, we were, I guess, what you would call uh, uh, a top ten team, but um, there were teams, there were teams running behind us that we were uh, probably only spending about a third what they were spending. But it cost us about a hundred and ten thousand a weekend. Hundred and ten. About a hundred and ten was what it cost a weekend. So, and as I say, that doesn't prorate, prorate all your expenses for motors, cars, engine building, the cars. The hundred and ten that over, that would be all inclusive. That's what we we more or less our break even point for sponsorship. If we had a hundred and ten uh, a sponsor, then we're going to hit break even. I, I was going to say, and how many races pay a hundred and ten? Well, that's the whole point uh, in nationwide. When you look at the nationwide purses, that's where it really got broken. Mm -hmm. um, I, I felt like the, the first year uh, that, you know, when uh, NASCAR went to the corporate package of television. Um, now, you guys know as well better than I do. When television comes in to write that big check to NASCAR, what are they buying? They're buying Nielsen ratings because that's what they sell. They buy them, they sell them. Okay, after the first year, you can maybe do some adjusting here. 
uh, for sake of, of ease of example, if, if the uh, cup ratings are five and the nationwide ratings are 2.5, that's pretty simple. It's a two to one ratio. Right. So, okay, divide that big TV money up by, by three mm -hmm. and two thirds of it goes to cup and one third of it goes to nationwide. Did you guys, did nationwide teams get any TV money? I know cup, cup teams did. Uh, He's grinning funny. It, uh, it, it went into the purse money is okay. how, is how so the teams got it. It went into the purse money. I got you. But did it go in that ratio of $2 to $1? No. It went in a ratio of more like $6 to $1. Wow. Wow. And it was for some reason, for some reason, it was so heavily skewed toward the cup teams. But here you come with a nationwide car. And as you guys know, you set a nationwide car beside a cup car, can't tell them apart, mm -hmm. put the same paint scheme on them. They're, they're basically the same car. Uh, remove the COT car tomorrow concepts, the differential of time and all. They're the same car. Costs the same to haul a, a Bingo. nationwide car to it, California. To as buy a that car. Peterbilt and that 53 footer costs the exact same. same that man. spindle that you they, buy, they does it same. know where it's going on a cup or, uh, well, okay, what about the uh, wheels? Diesel same. fuel Tires, costs the same. same. The diesel fuel. The, <laughs> Uh, we, you know, when we call to, to book the hotels, yeah. and you know they charge you they, three they times. They don't say, are you, are you are a you nationwide? A cup? Are you a nationwide? Right. They never once asked. <laughs> no, it was a, so. You know, when you start looking at those expenses laid out like that, but yet the first money is so skewed. It, again, check it on more than fifty percent of the race weekends. The last place, Start and Parker, on the Cup side on Sunday, will get more money than the guy who drove the full whatever, 250, 300, whatever mm -hmm. number of laps, miles, mm -hmm. uh, the day before in Nationwide. And maybe won the race. We'll get more money yeah. than the winner yeah. of the Nationwide race. Right. For, running, for running four laps and they ran 300. Yeah. Exactly. It's yeah. crazy. Tell you what, we're going to continue this conversation. When we come back, we're going to talk just a little bit more about how maybe to correct this. And we'll get Gary cooled down during the break, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. You know <laughs> what? If he keeps up like this, we'll have to send him and his radiator <laughs> on the USA Motor Machine over on Cleveland Avenue, uh, where, uh, you know, even if it's you that's a little bit hot, I'll bet those guys can take care of you. No, seriously, USA Motor and Machine on Cleveland. From your daily driver to your race car, they've got you covered. We'll be back with more on Pit Pass. And welcome back, everybody, to Pit Pass. I'm Joe Williams, along with Larry Woody and our special guest, Gary Baker. Gary, when we left, we were talking about all the fees and all the things that go into NASCAR and how the, the purses and the TV money. You know, it sounds like we need somebody to step up and fix this. And Hope Hines, in his new book, In Hindsight, I think I've got Larry has a copy of it. As we speak. And you're in there, Gary. Yeah. You're all through there. Taught that, me something in here. Well, if my mom was around, she'd buy a copy of that. <laughs> <laughs> But I, what I did not know, I, I remember when you went down and had a, had a long discussion with the folks in Daytona and, and met with Bill France Jr., I did not know you actually told them you'd make an offer on the whole shooting match. Well, <clears throat> one of those unknown but true stories, you know, uh, there, there would not have been three people, I guess, maybe four that were... Uh, around contemporaneously that would have known that occurred. But yeah, we, we had a very serious discussion. This was one of those, I, I would imagine I was in his office, in Bill Jr.'s office, probably about three hours. Uh, the first two, two and a half of it, Mike Helton was in there with us. And we, at the time, were talking about um, getting Nashville back on the, back on the, the circuit heavy discussion, good discussion. Uh, Bill Jr. loved Nashville, and I've, I've made the comment before that uh, direct quote from him, if he had a plain sheet of paper, the first city that he would put a racetrack in uh, is Nashville. And that's the quote in the book, too. Really? Okay. Well, it's, a, again, a true statement that he made. Um, crazy about Nashville. But um, the one hurdle, and we could overcome them all, I... He, he knew Nashville would be a super stop for, for the Cup Series, no question. And I think he foresaw the same thing I could foresee at the time. And I don't believe you guys would put any argument out that today this stop would be one of the, if not arguably the premier stop on the circuit. I think we'd probably be putting more people in the stands. 
uh, and what it would have done for the entertainment industry. Nashville was already a destination city, not as much so as it is today, but we would have, we would have uh, stepped that process up uh, by warp speed uh, to make this. That's why we would have a quarter million people sure. at each event today. Mm -hmm. Uh, and think of what that would do for the economics of Middle Tennessee region. He saw all that as well. But the one hurdle, he kept thinking a Nashville race would hurt Talladega. Obviously, Talladega was one of their tracks. And he just kept, he just kept coming back to the fact, I kept trying to say, no, it would help Talladega because the more fans we create, Birmingham is not loaded with motel rooms. So you need more one-day fans and camping fans. Okay, that's why the Talladega campground stretches from here to uh, Atlanta and back. That's right. um, it's huge. But why? No more. Okay, so we, we can create those one-day fans out of here in Middle Tennessee. Um, and we're going to be such a Midwestern member, no Indianapolis at the time. We're going to bring, because All-American 400 of the top five states, you yep. will remember, four yep. of them were Indiana, Ohio, Wisconsin, and Michigan. That's right. I said, we're going to be bringing people down here that uh, are and introducing them to, to NASCAR. And they say, well, after all, Henrietta, it's Talladega is only, you know, we're driving nine miles an hour. It's only another hour and a half south of Nashville. Let's go. Um, so it, it, I thought it was going to help Talladega, but uh, he just couldn't get over that hurdle. So then, um, yeah, I did say is it okay if we talk in private mm -hmm. and Mike Helton uh, stepped out of the room and then we went into a serious discussion and it was real uh, I had somebody at the time that was willing you, you could easily uh, International Speedway Corp even then was publicly held so you could very easily come up with a quote fair market value for International Speedway Corp right. Uh, you look at the, the current cap rate, uh, cap va capitalization value of the, of the entity on the market, and then you put a premium on it. That's all you're really discussing. Is it a 20% premium or a 40% premium? Uh, and he and I had the discussion. I said, you know, we'll, okay, we know, I knew at the time what the numbers were. Uh, here's the number. So it's, it's 20 or 25% was my opening. Mm -hmm. Um, and, of course, he was going to come back a little higher. The, the problem was, of course, NASCAR then and now not being publicly held. Uh, and as I explained, I said, you know, NASCAR, I can't give you a number that I'd be willing to offer right now. Uh, but, you know, confidentiality and uh, two to three weeks in the books and we'll give you a firm offer. Uh, and that's a starting point. And I said, don't worry, nobody's going to know we're talking it's that we'd went through all that stuff. And what I was trying to convince him to do, and this was back at the time when uh, you guys remember, his office was very open as well. Yep. So it was one of those kind of deals, track owners, uh, drivers, uh, crew chiefs, everybody just calling him all the time with these gripes. Um, that was why, of course, Mike Helton was, was plugged in there. As, and, and there was a small team there. Uh, that took some of that weight off of Bill Jr., but only some of it. Some of the guys, the old-time guys, still wanted to talk to mm -hmm. Billy, um, and they did. And you could call his phone number. You could, the secretary would answer, Absolutely. and he'd tell him who you were. And if he, he knew you, he'd punch you through because I was calling him about every day. <laughs> and for what it's worth, Gary, you already know this, but the listeners, as you, while you were flying back and forth from Daytona, uh, to Nashville Daytona almost every day after that 84 year when they pulled the cup races, I was calling almost every day because <laughs> that was one of the biggest stories, maybe the biggest sports story in Nashville at the time. It was the, at the time that was the, uh, NASCAR leaving was the equivalent of the Titans coming to town. That's how big that was. So my sports editor every day, check with France, call Daytona. And Gary, I would call him and I had a pretty good source at Daytona and he said, look, we're not coming back to Nashville. Nashville's cup races are gone. We're never coming back. We think the world of Gary Baker, we've worked with him at Bristol, worked with him in Nashville. He's one of our favorite people to work with, but we're not coming back for two or three reasons. One, we're saturated. We've got the Talladega factor, the Bristol factor, the Atlanta factor, and I think even back then they might have had their eye on the Indy factor. And secondly, we're not going to get bogged down with the fair board. He said, we're not coming back to Nashville. We love the market. We love Gary Baker. But without a big super speedway there, uh, it's not doable. 
And so we're not going to do it. So we'd, we'd run those headlines in the Tennessee and then the next day people like Joe Williams would call me up and chew me out. Well, there's that negative media again trying to kill what little chances we've got. And I said, look, I'm talking to people in Daytona who make the decisions and they say we're not coming back. I don't know what part of no you, we don't understand. They, they aren't coming back. And of course, and, and your, was, your reporting was dead on accurate. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. the, the thought of them coming back to the fairgrounds was laughable yeah, because yeah, they, of the, the facilities, yeah, number they, one. They just weren't going to do it. And, way and out of date. Gary, as I told you, I said, I'd, I'd like nothing more to go but to sit down in my typewriter at the Tennessee in the morning and write a story saying, NASCAR has changed its mind. They're coming back. Gary Baker's got a super speedway under construction. I said, that'd be the, the greatest story I, I would write in my career. And but of course, that's why gonna, we were trying to do that. Yeah, and if, and, and if it's we not going to happen, I can't write it. Right. And so. We knew. And that's why we were, we were looking at those two uh, locations knowing we had to build a super speedway, yeah. but okay, before you start laying in yeah. at the time, you're gonna build it for about 40 million. Yeah. Uh, today, it costs 450 million yeah. to build the track in Texas, but uh, the Formula One track, but uh, uh, before you do it, you get Bill to shake his head yes. Now, yeah. one of the Hunter, if you remember down there, Hunter Jim shook Hunter. his head, yeah. yeah, Jim Hunter. Jim Hunter. He shook his head, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it doesn't matter. Bill Jr. Bill had Jr. to shake his head, it. yes, yeah. and uh, when, he was not being able to get over that Talladega hurdle. That's when we had that conversation, and it was a serious conversation. And I'll tell you, somewhere about um, halfway through that conversation, I honestly thought he was leaning toward getting serious about doing this. He really gave me every indication he would talk about it because I was trying to say, you know, get on that 200-foot yacht and uh, sit back and drink mint juleps and uh, uh, clip corporate bonds, uh, <laughs> coupons, you don't have to take all these phone calls from Larry Woody yeah. and uh, yeah. Junior Johnson Pest. and, and, and Pe so uh, Gary, you, I, I don't think it's anything personal. I think that's such an emotional bond with the France family and NASCAR. Remember, Bill Sr. founded it. Bill yes. Jr., whom you were dealing with, was running at the time. Now we've got Brian running it. You know, it'd be almost like asking to sell a, a family business that your your dad and granddad and everybody's built it, it, it in other words it went more it Huge. went deeper than a business yeah. oh yeah a business. Uh, absolutely it was a family yeah. right family yeah. heirloom right. kind of deal and it it just it ended up uh he let me know at the end of the meeting after about an hour and we i thought we were and but then he brought it back down and said gary i'm just not going to do it yeah. uh and I said, if okay. they were going to sell they'd probably sell to gary baker but because of the family history and everything i i just don't believe the, the francis will ever yeah. ever well, let it go you got to figure there probably aren't that many people in the world with the uh with with the uh we're with all thank you I was thinking of something else, but that's a good word. <laughs> to, to even suggest it, to, to, to even think that, about suggesting it, much less to go to Bill France Jr.'s office yeah. and make an offer. So that tells me, yeah. Yeah, I wasn't wrong. Let me assure you, it was not my wherewithal. Uh, there was a financial backer that uh, uh, was uh, behind the scenes at the time. Uh, we didn't, and I did not, and Bill wanted to know where I would get the money. He sure. knew what, what kind of money we were talking about. And he asked that, and I told him there is a financial backer, but I said also, mm -hmm. of course, this financial backer had a background in the television industry. Mm -hmm. And part of the concept was, at the time, guys, remember, each track still Did put their together own. their own TV yep. deal. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, part of it is we're going to consolidate the television rights, and uh, frankly, that'll be some of it. And, of course... He didn't sell, but he did consolidate the television right? Which they did. Three they took, years later. They took your suggestion later. Two years later. Two and, years and started later. lighting tracks, as you suggested, too. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Isn't that amazing how that happens? If they don't listen to Gary. To begin with. <laughs> Tell you what else is amazing. Going to be some amazing things going on at Highland Rim this year. You may want to go up and see the folks, uh, our good friends Buddy Williams and all the crew at Highland Rim Speedway. Most of the, uh, most of the rules meetings are complete. They're getting ready to finish and post their schedule on their website. So don't forget to go by and see them at highlandrim.com. Gary, we want to thank you for, for coming in. Now, let's not kid anybody, Larry. Gary's coming back next week, too. That's right, another segment. We got another, another, uh, another segment that we can finish up. And I got a little something up my sleeve for both Gary and Larry. I'm not giving it up, but I will be wearing Kevlar next week. <sighs> We'll leave it at that. <laughs> That's kind of scary. I changed my mind. I'm, I'm, I'm busy next week. <laughs> Thank you, Gary Baker, for Larry Woody. I'm Joe Williams. Merry Christmas, everybody. We'll see you in the new year okay. on Pit Pass.